try to bring you high quality educational and informational content every single day. Why do you think the price is having such an anemic time? The news story of the hour. Is this the beginning of a massive financial unraveling? We gotta add a little addendum to the show back today. So we start here on the daily. Now we've been looking at the RSI on the Bitcoin's daily chart for the last several days. Well, it's been increasing over the last 50 years since we've been the government. Hey guys, what's going on? Jeb here and welcome back to Coffee and Crypto Live. This is your week daily morning show where we bring you the latest in everything in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And in today's episode, we are going to be talking about how Bitcoin and its fellow altcoins have had a major corrective movement over the weekend. And we're also going to be talking about the major halving event that is coming up here in just the next four days. As you probably know by now, we have a halving coming up, which means the block reward on Bitcoin will be dropping from 6.25 Bitcoin per block down to 3.125 Bitcoin per block, which means the miners' revenue on that front of the equation will be cut in half. What this means for Bitcoin and how the market reacts to this update is going to be absolutely critical when we are discussing exactly how to get Bitcoin uh, to go to $100,000 like we would like it to. So today we're going to talk about the buying opportunities that we are currently witnessing and how to build wealth in the cryptocurrency space. So I hope all of you guys are uh, looking forward to today's stream. Very, very excited to be here. I'm sorry about that technical difficulty. I know what happened and we're going to solve it so it doesn't ever happen again. Thank you so very much for your patience. Queen is in chat today. Doc Williams 111 is in chat, said good morning. Dominique B said looks better. Jason Barry's in chat. Our Master TV, Joe Bollier, Marley 123rd, uh, Greg F. Cosman B in chat said, let's try again. Good morning, Jeb, right now, right now. Paul Torelli's in chat. Abraham Lee, Satchet 321, Chasse is in chat. Michael Hall, Lion Daddy, Ernesto Ahumada. Ahumada. I think I said that right, actually. David Trahan, Fury Inferno, Blockchain James, Dharmendra Patel, Cedric Brandon, Lion Daddy again, Alex Naibo, Alan, Coin Operator, Schmedley B, Alex, so many people. Thank you very much for everybody who has tuned in. Let's get started. We've got a lot to talk about today. Right now, we are seeing a corrective movement on the altcoins. And several of them have dropped quite considerably over the last few days. Starting back on Friday, they all began a pretty large drop. Many of them have actually gone through a rally in the last 24 hours. But back um, late on Saturday, we saw them hit their bottom. Solana ended up dropping all the way down to about $140, actually even lower than that, going through a massive, massive corrective movement. Local high was $208. It dropped all the way down at the bottom to $120. Seven. Now, the reason that this is so interesting to me is because Solana was one of the fastest runners, which is why I had stopped buying Solana, because I thought that if we were going to see a corrective movement on the altcoins, it was probably going to come first and foremost to Solana, because it was the one that was most overextended. Um, if you've got a, uh, if you've got, yeah, so let's, lo let's look at the Solana chart here. What we've seen happen is actually to be kind of expected. I think I mentioned this level on stream last week. I may not have. I hope I did. But one of the levels that I've been kind of reminding us about has been the 0.786 level here on Solana, which sat at $124. $123.74. I have it drawn on this chart. We're on logarithmic, not regular, by the way. If we're on regular. We're looking at the 0.5 level, actually. But on a logarithmic chart... We set a local high right here at $125. Back late on Saturday, early on into Sunday, we saw Solana drop all the way down to $122. This is the bottom. And this was also a dead cat bounce. We managed to drop down to $121, rallied up to $122. That's great. Uh, sorry, $147. That's great. But we're still down 30%. So if you're looking to load up a Solana bag, you found a good time. All right, let's back up and talk a little bit about the overall market, actually. Because what I, what I want to cover here is the... Question of, has the bull market ended? I've seen a lot of comments in chat and uh, in the description box, and, or, or in the comment section, rather, um, talking about how this is the worst bull market ever. You know, the altcoins have barely even moved. It's all about Bitcoin. What's going on? I really do believe that we're just getting started. I greatly believe that this market is just taking off when it comes to the bull market. Bitcoin has not even gone through its halving yet. Just remember, guys, the entire bull market, bear market cycle for Bitcoin and the altcoins follows the four-year halving cycle, even though the halvings are far less significant now than they ever have been in past. And so when we look at the market, what we are seeing is that we are very far away from where we had gone into a rally during the last bull market. The last bull market, we saw the halving take place right around here. 
the altcoin bitcoin itself did not even start route did not even break all-time high until about um uh, eight months seven months after the all-time high we did not even see bitcoin break all-time high until seven months post having during the last bull market similarly if you look back on Solana, for example, which is kind of hard to even find a chart that goes back that far. Let's look on Ethereum. Um, the Ethereum charts pretty much all go th back that far. Ethereum did not break its all-time high. This is the halving right here. Did not break its all-time high until a year post-halving, almost. About 10 months post-halving. We have not even seen the halving happen yet. And so a lot of people are very concerned right now about this corrective movement that we've been witnessing. Well, a couple of things to that. Number one, Ethereum, for example has been on a non-stop almost rally for almost two years, from $800 to $4,000. It has increased in value by nearly 400% in the span of about two years. Very exciting movement there. Um, and the halving has not even occurred yet. The movement that we're seeing right now on Ethereum is not akin to this movement, because this all happened post-halving. In fact, all of this happened post-halving. The movement that we're seeing right now is more akin to this movement. We were seeing gains. Over the course of two years, Ethereum would rally about 300%. Notice that? You see the difference there? Let's go to another Ethereum chart. Go ahead and uh, get us a clean chart. The market that we are seeing right now in Ethereum is far more akin to this market right here, where we rallied, you know, 400 to four, uh, you know, 300 to 400, 500% in the span of about two years. That's exactly what we've seen happen here. We've rallied a few hundred percent in the span of about two years. What came next was right around here. A little while after the halving, about six months post having, we started going to a major rally. Now, I think things are being um, transitioned to the right, uh, transitioned to the, sorry, to the left about three to six months maybe, but not all the way to right now. We are still quite a far way away from the 8, 10, 12 month post having altcoin rally that we saw last time. So from a timing standpoint, we haven't even gotten started. From a market capitalization standpoint, the cryptocurrency space actually already hit Let's go ahead and look here. Already hit $2.5 trillion. We are almost back at the previous bull market all-time high. And the altcoins have barely even taken off yet. Many of your favorite coins, like Chainlink, for example. We've talked quite extensively about Chainlink. Chainlink, for example, has not even come close to all-time high. It's sitting at 14 bucks. All-time high is 52 I think Chainlink could very easily go to $31. Now, we've had a massive correction in a market-wide correction. So it ended up dropping back down to the 0.382 Fibonacci level here around $12. But talk about a buy-in, guys. If you're confident that the market is going to return, then these are excellent buying opportunities. I'm very confident the market's going to return. The sentiment in Bitcoin is extremely strong. What we're witnessing right now is the fullness of the of the uh, uncertainty that we've been talking about about the halving. I've discussed this for the last three weeks. If you've been watching the stream, then you'll know that that's an insight that I've had for you, is that moving into the halving, a lot of people are going to get freaked out because we've never seen a halving occur after the all-time high was hit on Bitcoin. And by the way, so the coin market cap coming in with the update here for us as well. Hong Kong has approved the Bitcoin and Ethereum ETF application. So just to show you that people are still adopting Bitcoin, it's still popular, if you will, there is adoption going on around the world on Bitcoin and Ethereum and the rest of the cryptocurrency space right now. It is being institutionalized the world over into the securities market. And the reason that that is so significant is because what people are looking for in an investment is longevity. They want to know that the thing that they are investing in, the asset that they are investing in, is going to be able to go the distance. That it's going to be here in years. These are some of the largest ETFs that we have seen approved in a very long time. A lot of times when you go on the stock market, you're not worth $400 billion. It's kind of rare, right, for a company to do that. Normally, they're public by the time they get to being worth $400 billion. In fact, I'm not sure if there's any companies worth $400 billion. Last time I checked, SpaceX was the largest privately owned company. And it's, you know, people say it's worth about $200 billion. So that pretty much if you have a $400 billion company like Ethereum is worth $400 billion, which Ethereum is not a company, it's a commodity. But if you have a $400 billion anything, it's normally an ETF by now. Right? I mean, pretty much all of the commodities out there, corn, oil, soybean oil, like it, iron, nickel, you name it. There's an ETF for it. There's an ETF for that is the lingo in the securities market, right? So 
the fact that there is that there are uh, securities um, filings occurring for Bitcoin and Ethereum and and many of the other major cryptocurrency assets is one unsurprising is two it gives us the confidence that there will be a longevity to the cryptocurrency space and so that's where we get to stand back and say okay whether we fully understand it or not and we want to work on it as well as we could work on understanding it as best we can there is something here there is a real value proposition here there's a real value proposition in crypto and the world over is starting to realize this there is no ponzi scheme this large there is no scam that is literally just a scam and doesn't even at least convince enough people that it's worth something that gets to being worth 400 billion dollars now don't get me wrong there are there are corrupt systems that are worth 400 billion dollars but they generally may still be decent investments I don't like banks because banks make money by keeping you in slavery to debt. But I tell you what, their stocks perform well, right? Similarly, in cryptocurrency, even if, even if you don't believe in the technology, which I do, but even if you don't believe in the technology, what you can't deny is that millions of people do, and they are working in that technology. And so I'm very excited to tell you that this corrective movement on Bitcoin is not something that you need to be overly concerned about. You can see it as a massive, massive buying opportunity because some of these coins have not seen these levels in a couple of months. Solana being at $150, now you missed 127, which is what we saw, but we have not seen Solana at this level in about two months. Pretty exciting. Last time we were here, we were on our way up, right? Um, you're not, you're probably not going to see it at 100 again. But if you're trying to get Solana on the cheap, 148 is not bad. Cardano, for example, 48 cents. Its local high not long ago was 70. So even if you don't believe that Cardano can go back to $3.13, it can, it still has proven that it can go to 78. So even if you want to throw out the $3.13 all time high, it's still proven a month ago that it could be at 75. That would be about an 80% movement from here. And that's a conservative estimation of what can occur. Ethereum. Ethereum is having ETFs approved left and right. It is being institutionally adopted. It is still almost $2,000 away from its all-time high. I'm very excited to tell you that the cryptocurrency space is not going anywhere. It is here to stay. All right, let's talk a little bit about... Let's talk to chat just a little bit, and then we're going to keep it moving here. Guys, I do want to let you know that today's stream is brought to you in part by NordVPN. So make sure to go to nordvpn.com forward slash Jeb and sign up for a two-year plan, because if you do, you'll be getting access to security architecture that will be keeping you safe and secure while you browse online, and it'll also help to keep you invisible. So hackers and thieves and scammers and banks and phishing emails and governments can't see your your site traffic, which allows you to go unnoticed and go where you please online. Now, obviously, please use that power for good, like avoiding censorship and avoiding banks trying to tell you what you can and cannot do with your money. But the way that you're going to do that is by going to nordvpn.com forward slash Jeb and signing up for that two-year plan. So make sure to check that out. Thank you very much to them for sponsoring us. Larity's in chat said, hey, Jeb, I'm back in chat again. Hopefully, my name has updated to something a little bit more legible. What's your thoughts on airdrop hunting? Larry Snur is in chat with a smiley face. Um, airdrop hunting, I, I think that if you can find an airdrop and you can assure yourself that it is um, legitimate, then free money. Why not? But please do be very careful because there's a lot of people that are trying to scam you with airdrops. So um, is it a way to make money? Yes. Is it a way that anybody ever got rich? No. If you're trying to, it's one of those, um, it's a side hustle. Put it that way. Nobody ever got rich driving for Uber. But that's not to say that nobody who is rich didn't start out by driving for Uber. Um, so you're not going to get rich doing it. But if you're trying to pick up some side cash and that's the be that's one of the best ways that you can find to make money, then go for it. But if you're making two bucks an hour, you really have to calculate it based on how much money you're making per hour. Like for us, um, we found ourselves at, at some point where we would drive two hours to go and we would drive two hours to go and buy something that was used to save 40 bucks on it and it's like let's say it's 140 dollars new and we got it for 100 dollars, or we got it for let's say let's say even we got it for 40 dollars. we saved 100 dollars, but it costs four hours of our time on a weekend it costs gas wear and tear on the car and then we have to start calculating now wait a minute we're using our personal time where we could be spending with our kids to go and do this is it really even worth it to save 100 dollars and get this thing should we just not even get this thing should we buy it new there's definitely a place to buy things that are used we buy stuff 
all the time that's like in exact in brand new condition, 70% off. Why not? I love saving money. That penny saved is a penny earned, right? Dollar saved is dollar earned. That being said, you do have to calculate what your time is worth. For me, my time, because of the business I run, is worth hundreds, if not thousands of dollars an hour. So if I so if it's during a work day or something, I'm not doing that. Right. I got I I cannot afford to do that. You have to kind of figure out what is my working time worth. It's not about what you are worth. You are infinitely valuable because you're made in the image of God, but your marketplace value, what is your dollar value in your time worth? What is that time worth? Is it worth spending three hours trying to find an airdrop that's gonna make five bucks? Probably not. Is it worth going on Coinbase and making a dollar in 30 seconds because of their little Coinbase earn thing? They will literally pay you a dollar in a coin to learn about a coin. It's the way the coin does kind of a um, pseudo version of like sponsorship, if you will, to get their name out there. Um, so you can go over there. I earned four bucks of Near Protocol, right? Because it took it took two minutes to learn a few facts and answer a little short quiz about Near Protocol. And then boom, got four bucks. Took two minutes. Why not? Sure. So you just kind of have to calculate what your time is worth. <laughs> All right. Let's read a little bit more chat. Back then, you can make $25 to $30 an hour, Jets said. What are you referring to? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um, do you hear that Hong Kong is going to let their people buy Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Iran just ate my Bitcoin. Yes, and that's something that we need to talk about is that Iran launched um, uh, missiles into, actually, there were drones, excuse me, into... Um, into Israel in response to an Israeli attack on an Iranian embassy in Damascus. And uh, that was one of the triggers that led to the drop on Bitcoin. And so I'm not going to get a bunch into the geopolitics today, although that would be very interesting because it is a very, uh, it is an interesting subject for me. But what I will say is that um, the conflict as it has started um, is not full-blown war yet. But it definitely sent shockwaves through the market. We've seen drops on the S&P 500 recently as a result of that as well. We saw a drop here on SPY that had started a couple of weeks ago, but it really did. It really um, has kind of escalated here um, just today in pre-market hours. It was trading down, and then it's about it's down by about half a percent. This is the S&P 500 down about half a percent, down to 512. Uh, DJI doing the same thing, down a few hundred points. Um, so we're seeing, you know, similar similar events taking place here um, as a result of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that we have seen as a response to that drone attack from Iran. Um, so drones and missiles, Richard Leinhardt said, that's right. Um, so it, it's kind of causing a whole mess because there's already the conflict that's going on in Israel with, um, with, uh, in um, Hezbollah. Sorry, not Hezbollah, with um, their conflict on... I'm forgetting their name. Hamas, sorry. The, uh, with Hamas. Um, and of course, Hezbollah has been on the north, um, you know, threatening Israel for quite some time. And then Iran's attacking. And so the United States has basically vowed to protect Israel from anything that comes its way. And that has definitely sent, like I said, shockwaves around the world in um, markets. Iran is a very powerful nation. And one of the reasons that there is such a concern there is because Iran borders what's known as the Persian Gulf, which is probably one of the most important waterways on planet Earth. The Persian Gulf c accounts for about 20% of global crude traffic and natural gas traffic. So uh, when you leave the Persian Gulf, you have to go through a little narrow strip of water. I'll pull a map up to show this. Um, you have to go through a little narrow stra uh, strip of water called the uh, Strait of Hormuz. Here, I'm pulling it up right now. Uh, pull, Zoom all the way over here show you why this is so significant, why this has been impacting markets. Here's Israel. Israel has been fighting Hamas over here in Gaza. They are facing Hezbollah to the north here in southern Syria and in some parts of Jordan and Lebanon. And Ira uh, Iran launched drones and missiles from over here. Iran, modern-day Persia, has launched drones and missiles into Israel in response to an Israeli attack on a Syria on a uh, Iranian Iranian uh, uh, embassy in Damascus, which is the capital of Syria. Now, part of the reason that this is such a big deal is because if Iran and Israel go to war, that would probably bring into the fray just about every single nation in between and adjacent, including Jordan, Iraq, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and more. And Iran 
is right here on the Persian Gulf. You've got Kuwait over here. You've got Iraq, Iran, and Saudi Arabia all being major oil and natural gas exporters. They all export directly onto, um, into, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, natural uh, LNG, liquid natural gas um, ships, and uh, crude oil tankers here in the Persian Gulf. Those tankers have to leave through this little strait called the Strait of Hormuz. The Strait of Hormuz has been blockaded before, and if it were to be blockaded, it would be, um, hmm, how would you say, uh, bad news bears for the economy, and you would see the price of crude oil and natural gas shoot through the freaking roof. If you shut off 20%, you essentially shut down the entire market. You probably more than double the price of crude because it is such a fickle market. Um, it, it would be very simple for Iran to simply say, if you try and pass through the Strait of Hormuz, we will launch a missile at you. And what happens at that point is that you have every single insurance carrier on the planet for those um, for those merchant vessels say, we are not carrying insurance on you anymore in this area. They basically say this is a contested area and we will not allow for our insurance policy to apply if you are planning on sailing through the Persian Gulf, which means they will no longer be insured, which means they are no longer allowed to do business anywhere on the global market, which means that Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, and basically every Everybody else in the region is no longer able to export oil and natural gas. And in case you haven't learned anything about the history of the Middle East, that's kind of a problem. Because it's about the only thing of value over there that's in the ground. You can't grow anything over there. There's not that many precious metals. It's kind of oil and LNG. So when Iran is launching missiles at, at Israel, there's a geopolitical concern that it's going to bring the United States into a direct conflict with Iran because of the because of the because of the alliance that we have with Israel. But there's also an economic factor there. So these that that's just kind of a five minute peek into what's going on. A lot of people are very concerned about about Iran and Israel both acting irrationally here. But what else is new on both of their fronts? Um, Israel has been solemnly, uh, you know, firmly condemned for bombing the for uh, attacking the embassy in Damascus for it just being kind of a needless um, escalation. But the exact same thing has been said for Iran for launching a buttload of missiles and drones into their land. So it's a bit of a mess. And whenever you have a mess in geopolitics, that obviously impacts economics. And so that's where geopolitics comes into the markets. And that's what we're seeing a lot lately. So let's read a little bit more chat. But if you're wondering why the markets have been correcting over the last 48 hours, that has been a part of it. All right. Yo, yo, Jebster. Is it good to see you French toasters? Um, Shadrach Frost said, folks, please hit the like button now. It only takes a second and truly supports the channel. Let's, so, let's show Jeb some love and appreciation for all he brings to us every day. Thanks, friends. Thank you very, very much right now. I appreciate that. Go ahead and hit the like button. We've got over 500 people watching. Let's see if we can't get to well over 100 likes. Uh, let's see. Cool. All right. Let's keep it moving here, guys. We are going to talk a little bit about uh, Bitcoin because we haven't talked about Bitcoin yet. We talked a little bit about Solana Cardano. What I want you to understand about Bitcoin is that Bitcoin has been needing a corrective movement. And so have the altcoins for that matter. We've had a huge, huge rally. I mean, does this rally not look parabolic? It does. You know what's funny? We're already on the linear, the logarithmic chart. If you go to regular, it looks insanely parabolic. I think that anybody with half a brain cell would understand that Bitcoin needs a corrective movement here. Right? Do, it, are we? On, I, I hope we're on the same page with that. Bitcoin's got to go through correction sometimes. It it just has to. It just does. It's it's not really one of those things that you can debate. It's just a fact of life. It's got to go through a corrective movement from time to time. And what we're seeing right now is that corrective movement. Because as I've always taught you, there are two ways that Bitcoin can correct. In time and in space. And right now, Bitcoin is correcting in space. It is moving, sorry, in time. It is moving sideways. It's not so much moving down. Yeah, it moved down a few thousand dollars over the weekend. But what it's actually doing on the general trend is that it's moving sideways in one gigantic symmetrical triangle pattern. At this point, it's not even so much a symmetrical triangle pattern as it is just more or less a, a trading channel. It's pretty much just trading sideways in a range. It's a ranging pattern, a trading channel, whatever you want to call it. The good news is, because it sits at the top of a gargantuan behemoth of a rally, it actually stands as what's known as a bull flag. Bull flags generally, about 70% of the time, break bullish. And depending on how we draw the price target, we have a price target sitting up here at $120,000. That's how we would draw it if we drew 
from the bottom at $38,000 and extrapolated here. But on the other hand, if we drew on the regular chart, on the regular chart here, then it probably then it would not be as high. It'd be a little bit it'd be a little bit lower, but it'd still be a very significant bull flag, pointing us up to about ninety-eight thousand dollars. So call it a hundred thousand dollar price target. If Bitcoin, and I say if, but it's probably more of a win, Bitcoin breaks bullish out of this uh, pattern, it's going to end up sending us into a major rally. Now here's the thing. Bitcoin has gone through a corrective movement. And if you'll remember, just a couple of days before we started this range, I told you it was coming. We had seen Bitcoin rally for 50 days straight with pretty much no stopping for anything. This Monday on, I believe it was March the 12th. That was a Tuesday. March the 11th. March the 11th. You can go back and watch that stream. I predicted that within the next few weeks, I said, I think I said next one to six weeks, something like that. We were going to see a pretty large corrective movement of 15 to 25%. I think I ended up saying 20% with a, with a range. We saw on that Thursday, the beginning of a corrective movement, they would drop a 17.76%. Yay, America. We have seen then, after that, 33 days of sideways trading. That was a month ago. Bitcoin rallied for 50 days, traded sideways for 33 so far. Well, this actually makes a lot of sense. If any of you have ever studied Elliott Wave formations, then you will know that what we see sometimes is what is known as a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 Elliott Wave movement. I think that's a lot of what we're seeing right now. We're seeing an uptrend forming here on Bitcoin. And then we saw the corrective movement that was relatively short. But you could also draw the corrective movement right here because we really stopped trading um, you know, bullish right about here. And then we saw the two wave, sorry, the three wave, which, which was a, uh, you know, a bullish wave as it naturally is. Then we're seeing this, this fourth wave here, the fifth wave in Elliott wave would be a major rally followed by uh, an ABC corrective wave, which may look something like this. And you could build a big inverse head and shoulder, a big head and shoulders pattern, drop down to $50,000 or something, whatever it may be. But generally speaking, this one, two, three, four, five, pattern is what we're probably going to see happen. We actually saw something pretty similar to this happen as well. We saw an Elliott wave formation take place over here. One, two, three, four, five. And then we saw, you can see here, A, B, C corrective wave. You see how you can kind of draw all of these together? Hopefully you're seeing that, right? So the point is not that Bitcoin has to rally. The point is that statistically speaking, with the ETFs being approved, not just in America, but around the world, with the mass adoption that is beginning, and this is the, the these are the first waves of mass adoption, it is unlikely that Bitcoin is not going to hit $100,000 at this point. Bitcoin was a cool commodity that, you know, cool cats and kittens played with back in 2020, to, you know, reference um, the meme of the day back in 2020. It was the meme coin of the masses, if you will. Nowadays, it is far more institutionalized than ever before. With an ETF being approved from 11 companies on the same day in the United States, Bitcoin essentially said, I'm here to stay. Don't really care what you think. We're going to be here for good. And so now it has become an investment of choice, which is why this is the first time in history, really, that I am strongly recommending people to hold some of it for life as part of your retirement. We have, a, we have something called the financial sovereignty way that we teach. One of, the t one of the principles that we teach in the financial sovereignty way is that you must master what you have before you move on. When you're picking cherries from a cherry tree, you pick the bottom cherries first, and then you pick the ones a little bit higher that you can reach by just pushing your hand up a little bit further or standing on your tiptoes, then you get a, a step stool, then you get a ladder. Then you get a cherry picker and you pick up at the top, right? You get the easiest return first. You build out systems and, and, and you bring sovereignty over what you already have first. How do you bring sovereignty over your current lifestyle? You get out of debt and you invest to save for retirement for the day that you can't work. That, after you've done that, then that's where you start investing to grow your lifestyle. You invest to secure your wealth today by getting out of debt, tomorrow by investing for retirement, and also by, you know, of course, investing in your personal development and whatnot. And then from there, that's when we invest on top of that to build wealth. And that's where we are in Bitcoin right now is that Bitcoin has become such a sure commodity that has been so ruthlessly consistent 
that people now trust it enough to hold it for decades. That is a seal of approval that not many commodities or assets or companies ever achieve. Of course, if you're in the S&P 500, for the most part, you've achieved that status. But Bitcoin is well and truly into the S&P 500 if it were to be put into place based on market capitalization alone. I mean, being the S&P 50, if that was a thing, right? So where am I going with this? Most people are generally taught the exact same thing that I just said. Why? Because it's common freaking sense. You secure the future before you would grow the now. That is called wisdom. Making sure that you are able to retire with dignity one day is more important than having a flashier car now. There's a reason that people that have flashy cars and they show off on Instagram but don't have a retirement, a lot of times end up going broke is because they don't have the character that it takes to build long-term wealth because they have not taken a long-term perspective. I was a fool that did that. I was building a giant company. I was not investing for retirement at all. It was a complete mess. It's a joke. And the what I'm saying here is that most people that are wise, and if they're wise, they probably have money, realize I'm going to secure the future before I increase the now. I'm going to invest to make sure that I have money in the bank and I have wealth and I have financial peace and all of these things before I get flashier things now. How do they do that? They invest in assets that they are willing to drink, bring with them into retirement. Do you see where, the, where I'm going with this? Those people that are wise are investing for the long run. And they are now including Bitcoin in those investments because they are confident enough in it that they think it will be a valid investment for the long run. Which means you've got a lot of wise people buying Bitcoin now. Not just fools that are trying to get rich quick. Not easy money. No, we're talking about wise people. You know why you want wise people to buy your stock or buy your company or to buy your Bitcoin? Because they typically buy and hold for a long time, which means they lock up the supply and pull it out of circulation, which increases the market capitalization, which increases the price, which makes you, the investor, more money. The reason that investors make money on things is because they all invested in it together. And so they all ended up making money on it. And a similar thing is occurring right now on Bitcoin. There is a large degree, there's a large percentage of America that is investing in Bitcoin right now because they now even in their wisdom, believe that it is a good long-term investment. Even if they think the rest of the altcoin space is wishy-washy and say, ah, if it's still here in 10 years, then I'll buy it. They're starting to buy Bitcoin. They're starting to put it in IRAs at an astonishing rate. They're buying the ETFs in their Roth IRAs, in their IRAs, their traditionals. That's what they're doing. And for good reason. They're securing the future. And part of the way they're doing that is they're including Bitcoin because they believe that this is a narrow point in history where you're going to get really solid entries on Bitcoin where it could massively outperform the S&P 500. In the last 10 years, the S&P 500 has gone up almost 10x, in case you didn't realize that. I mean, it, it's huge rallies have taken place. Sorry, in the last 20 years or so. Huge rallies have taken place on even the S&P 500. But um, yeah, in the last, uh, let's see, in the last uh, 30 years, S&P 500 has 10x. People are thinking, I think Bitcoin could 10x in 10 years, not in 30. I think it's a 10-year time horizon. That won't always be the way Bitcoin is. Eventually, Bitcoin will stabilize out and look something like this. Eventually, Bitcoin will stabilize out and look something like the S&P 500. In 20 years, it'll start looking like this. And you'll see a 1,000x return, a 10x return over the course of 30 years. Again, it'll end up being almost just like the S&P 500. It'll march right alongside it. In fact, it may even underperform it eventually. For now... It is massively outperforming it. And people realize that the next 20 years are a unique point in history where that's going to occur. And so that's why Bitcoin is not going to drop down to $20,000. It's not going to drop down to $30,000. If it drops anymore below 61, which was a level that we predicted would probably happen, actually. I don't know if you remember that last week. We said it would probably drop down here to about 61 at, uh, at the lowest. That's where it went. If we drop any farther, 53 is probably the level we're going to go to. From there, people are just going to be too excited to buy it. Bitcoin is a, has that longevity factor that a lot of the other altcoins don't yet have. Ethereum is getting there. It's not quite there yet. But Bitcoin is now in a category of its own. It has ascended. It is transcendent into traditional finance as part of the masses investment vehicle. And so if you want to be successful in life, you follow the financial sovereignty way. You do it for a long time. And then you end up making sure... And then you end up... Um, and then you end up building wealth. 
All right. Let's read some chat. Is there any update on the having date and time? Uh, I, it's still looking like the 19th. I know everybody's thinking they want, everybody wants it to be on 420. Um, every, from what we can tell, everyone still thinks that it's going to be on 419. So, <laughs> looks like it's going to be on 419. <laughs> Let's see. Estimated, um, it's looking like it's, so Watcher.Guru actually has a clock here. Um, yeah. April 19th at 9.48 p.m. So I guess some somewhere in the world it might be on 420. I'm not sure. All right. Liquidity wife, we were ready for blast off. Yes, a lot of people got liquidated. That's for sure. Prepared for both scenarios. Yep. All right. Appreciate. I appreciate all of you for tuning in. Jeb, I have uh, $21,000 in crypto, mostly e mostly ETH and Bitcoin, some ADA H bar, Adam Vet. My bank paying all, my bank paying out my debt and still about $6,000 in debt left. Should I sell my crypto to pay debt or wait for it to go up? I typically don't like telling you guys to in, to touch your investments to pay off debt. That unless they're in profit. Um that being said, my question for you Eric would be, do you have any way that you could pay off that $6,000 in debt in the next 6 months? If that's all of your non-mortgage debt, do you have any way that you can, this is what I teach, do you have any way that you can pay off that $6,000 in debt in the next six months? I want you to be debt-free within six months, ideally sooner than that. Is there any way you could make $2,000 and throw $2,000 a month at it for um, for three months and pay it off that quickly? If it's going to take you more than $6,000, I would start liquidating some of those short-term investments to pay it off, actually. Um, maybe not all of it. You've got 21,000, you'd be left with some, but if you've got some of those assets that are already in a lot of profit, if you've had them for a while, then I would start liquidating them from the, from the riskiest investment and from the investment that you understand the least about, uh, first and use that to throw that at the debt. If you don't think it's at all possible for you to get it paid off in the next six months, very, very, very important to be out of be out of debt guys. This weekend, don't trip by the debt. Bad week to be broke. Other needed facets of life we're calling. Yep. Why we want to get out of debt, live in the profit, live in the green, have margin, increase our ability to generate income. All of these things are very important. It's not just about crypto. Crypto alone will not make you wealthy. You will make you wealthy. Say it with me. You will make you wealthy. And as we come to a conclusion here, I want to harp on that for a minute. We have the ability to totally take control of our lives. We have the ability to be the ones that are directing our lives, but we have to actually do it. A lot of times the reason that we are not taking charge of our lives is because we feel like we're not, there's no hope. What I want you to do is think about an area in your life that you need to improve. Maybe there's a habit that you need to break. Maybe there's a habit that you need to begin. Maybe there is a friend that you need to cut off and say, hey, you're a bad influence on me. I'm not going to be around you. Maybe there's some part of your life that you need to improve. Maybe there's a hundred for every one of us. There's at least a hundred areas of our life that we need to improve. Pick one that in the next week you can get on top of and get a little bit of momentum. Get, pick one and say, bye golly, because you're from the South and you're over the age of 80. Say, bye golly. Got to say it. Got to have some enthusiasm there. I am taking charge of this area of my life. I will be in control of this part of my life. This far, no farther. This is the red line. Do not cross. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. This is my life. I am taking charge of it. Period. I'm in charge. I am the captain now, not you. You've got to have that moment of saying, I will self-direct my life under God. I will be financially sovereign, period. I know so many people in life that are stressed out because their life is full of stress. Let me teach you something. Stress comes from disorganization. Peace comes from organization. Peace ultimately comes from God. But one of the ways that it comes to you is through you having an organized life and you are in control of the areas of your life that you are supposed to be in control of. If you want financial peace, then seek to be financially sovereign. Financial peace is the goal. Financial sovereignty is the tool. So seek to be sovereign. Look around. Say, hey, my room's a mess. Clean my room. No, 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 no. Don't just clean your room. Make a system for where everything in your room goes. And as soon as you make a mess, put everything back. My finances are out of control. Oh, I just need to spend less. No. 
you need to potentially spend just as much as you're spending. Maybe you do need to spend less. Maybe you don't. You don't know. Maybe you ought to spend more on, on enjoyment. Maybe you ought to invest more. Maybe you're just squirreling money around. What you need is to have a system for it. You need to put a budget in place and say, this is where my dollars are going. With your relationships, you need to say, man, I just need to have, I need to have, I need to get rid of some people in my life. It's not even so much that. It's, I need to find good friends to fill in the gap after I get rid of those bad people in my life. I've got an addiction. It's not just about saying, I've got to break this addiction. Could be video games, could be caffeine, could be alcohol, could be drugs, whatever it is. It's not just, I need to get rid of this addiction. It's need, I need to get rid of this addiction and have a plan for what I'm going to do when I feel tempted to do that. I need to say, all right, instead of drinking 15 cups of coffee a day, I'm going to go for a walk, right? You need to have a system. Stress comes from disorganization. Peace comes from organization. Stress comes from disorganization. Peace comes from organization. It is ultimately a fruit of the spirit. How do we get peace? By being sovereign. By following the Holy Spirit, first and foremost, obviously. But by being sovereign, practically speaking. If you have peace in a mess, you're psychotic. You're crazy if you have peace in a messy home. That's a problem. You shouldn't have peace. You should be discontent. If you are a hoarder and there's stuff everywhere and there's trash everywhere and you've got a bunch of stuff that you're never going to use, you should not be content with that. Because it is driving you crazy on the inside. And if you just turn your head and go, la, 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 I know, I, I'm going to use it one day. It's driving you nuts. You should not, and believe it or not, you don't actually have peace in a mess. You have peace when you're in control of the things you're supposed to be in control of. And by the way, you have peace when you're not trying to control the things you can't control. You got teenagers, you can't control their stupid decisions. You got parents that aren't acting the way they should, you can't control their decisions. You can control yours, though. The secret to peace is being in control and being organized in the areas that you're supposed to be in control and organized and letting go and not being worried about the areas that you're not supposed to be in control about and you're not supposed to worry about because it ain't your freaking problem and you can't do anything about it anyway. Get control of your finances. Be sovereign. Find something this week that you can say, I will take charge of this, even if it's just cleaning off your desk, even if it's just organizing the files on your laptop, even if it's just saying, I'm going to buy Bitcoin $10 a week every single week and I've got that organization built into my life now. Start somewhere. As the African proverb goes, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Takes a long time. Takes years, in fact. Uh, one final thing I'll say. In the, in, it's either in the Marines or the SEALs. I don't remember, but uh, pretty much every branch of the military teaches this. Um, the, the military, a, a lot of times in boot camp, they have a bell. And if you want out, the Marines, I think this is Marines. I think it's Marines and SEALs do this. They have a bell. If you want out at any time, just go ring the bell. Ding, 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 ding. I quit. Um, the people that make it through, uh, basic make it, especially in the Marines and, and the SEALs, because it's a lot more intensive. The people that make it through are the, are not the people that think I've got another eight hours to go in mud and in rain, because that's, that's not something you can find hope in. I've got eight more hours of this. Oh my goodness. This is awful. It's like 30 degrees out here. I can't feel my fingers. I'm going to die. I've got shots going over my head. That's, those aren't the people that make it, that think I've got another three days of this. It's the people that say, I've got to make it to the end of this trench. That's all I'm worried about right now. I'm just worried about this one thing right in front of me. Just worried about this one thing. If I can just make it here, if I can just make it the next three minutes to this one bite-sized little goal, then I'll be good. And then when they get there, they say, all right, if I can just make it to this next little bite-sized goal, those are invariably the people that make it through the hell that the military puts you through not that I've ever been through it, but this is what I hear from people that have gone through it. Those are invariably the people that make it through. Are the It's not the people that are the fastest, the strongest, or the smartest. It's the people that understand that. That it's not about focusing on where you're supposed to be in 10 hours. It's about focusing where I'm supposed to be in three minutes and getting there and doing a good job. And then in three minutes, doing that again and again and again and again, and again until it's 10 hours from now, and then you've done all of it. Because you get overwhelmed. All right, I'm ranting. Hope that you guys have enjoyed today's stream. And by the way, with Bitcoin correcting here, please don't worry about it. With Bitcoin dropping even as we speak, it presents an excellent buying opportunity. Um, and potentially even look at a lump sum investment here, guys.
We are going to wrap it out. I hope you've enjoyed today's stream. Before I go, though, guys, I do just want to first remind each and every one of you that all success begins with a daily and personal walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I also, before I go, first want to thank each and every single last one of you for watching. As always, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace. Oh, I got a real